Thank you, worship team. It's great to have Craig back on stage. Craig's one of our bass players. He's been out for a couple of months, but he hasn't missed a beat, no pun intended. Thanks for our worship team. We have a great team that leads us every, every morning. Uh, so good morning, welcome. Those of you who are here, those of you who are online, welcome. It's great to, to have you worshiping with us uh, this morning. If you're a guest, either in person or online, in person there's a guest card right in the seat pocket in front of you. Um, if you're online, you can click a link and that'll take you to our online uh, guest connection card. Uh, we just love to connect with people. So if you want to fill this out and give us any information that you want to, um, no pressure to do that, but you can drop it in the offering box right at the back of the sanctuary on your way out this morning. But we just want to welcome you to our service and, and, and thank you for, for being with us. Uh, we're also doing communion today. So if you didn't get one of these on your way in, if you're in person, our, our worship team is going to lead us in a, in a song uh, just before we do communion towards the end of our service. And they are right outside in the lobby and you can sneak out and grab one there. And if you're at home online, just go ahead when you get a chance and grab the elements that, that you're going to be using for your communion there. Uh, where you are. Um, just a couple of announcements that we have. First of all, um, our intro class is coming up on uh, February 26th. That's the last Sunday of this month. It'll be at 5 30 uh, right out here. We'll set up our lobby uh, for that uh, and we would love to have you for this. If you're new, if you've been around for a little while but have never been through our intro class, it's just an opportunity just for us to share a little bit more about who our church is, some of the things we believe, some of our values, how we're structured, our leadership, now, all of that good stuff just covers some of the frequently asked, asked questions about our church. And so we'd love to have you join us uh, for that. If it's been a while since you've done intro and you're just interested in kind of a refresher, we're always happy uh, to have you back uh, for that as well. And then finally, small groups um, are, are also starting next um, or that, that same week, February 26th, uh, the end of this month, we'll be starting a whole new semester uh, of small group. We've got lots of groups uh, this semester. They're all really good groups, different times of the week, uh, different days of the week, uh, different topics, different things they're going to be uh, looking at. Um, but check those out over the next week or two and find a spot. If you need help, I'd love to help you connect. Any of our staff members can talk to you about our small groups uh, and help you find a, a really good group for you. You can click on the QR code that's right in front of you on the back of that seat if you want to use your smartphone to do that. Uh, and that'll take you to our, smart, our, our, our small groups. You can read the descriptions, and there's a, there's a sign-up for, for each one of those. Uh, so sign up for small groups and, and join this, this semester. And then also hypothermia is coming up very, very quickly. So I'm going to have Jeff uh, come up and tell us a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit about what's going on with, with hypothermia. Thanks, David. Good morning. Uh, I wanted to just share a little bit about what happens on the early morning uh, shift during hypothermia week uh, and encourage you all to sign up for that shift or for other roles within HRW. Uh, for the early morning shift, we have a couple people come in at 5 a.m. and relieve the, the folks that have stayed overnight, and another couple people come in at 5.30. Uh, we uh, start making coffee, we start gathering up the breakfast and lunch items that folks prepared the previous day. We get everything set out for breakfast. Uh, lights come on at 6, uh, which is when breakfast starts. Uh, we spend between 6 and 7 really just uh, having some fellowship time with the guests. Uh, 7 o'clock uh, we close. Uh, and gather up the remaining food items, get those back to the kitchen, do a little bit of uh, very light cleanup, and uh, take out the trash, and we're generally done uh, by about 7.30. Uh, so if you're interested, we have sign-up spots available, particularly later in the week. Uh, it only takes a couple, three hours of your time, uh, and uh, you won't regret it. Uh, I was asked to share, you know, sort of why I do this. I've been doing this I don't know how long I've been doing this, long time, uh, more than 15 years, I think, uh, in the early morning. And originally it was a time that was convenient for me, uh, so I could still go to work, um, but I still like the early morning time. And one of the reasons that I serve is that in the mornings, you get that moment when you come in where all of the guests are sleeping, they're all warm, they're all well-fed, they're all safe, and that's what this is all about. 
is just all of us being able to provide that for them uh, if just for a week. Um, so I encourage you to sign up. Again, if not for the morning, for the other shifts, if serving during that week uh, is not your thing, uh, we have other opportunities. Uh, we'll have a prep day next Sunday right after church. Uh, if you want to show up for that, we'll spend two or three hours getting the other end of the building uh, ready to host our guests the following week. Uh, we'll have a donation station set up next week for unused uh, travel size toiletry items, uh, socks, underwear, t-shirts, that sort of things that we can, we can share with the guests. And we can always use all the prayer uh, you can do for this upcoming week. So I encourage you to serve. You won't regret it. Thanks. After the service, if you have any questions, they can help you find a spot to serve. But let's go to God in prayer this morning. God, we thank you uh, for a day to worship you, and we thank you for... This opportunity we have with hypothermia that's coming up um, just, to, for just to take a week and to give back to people who desperately need our help and our support. So I just pray that you would just bless everyone who serves during that week. Um, we thank you for our leadership team who's been guiding us for, for a couple of months now. Um, we just pray for the guests that will be here. Um, we pray for the churches that are serving right now and will continue to serve throughout the, the remainder of the winter months. Uh, we thank you for FACETS and the Lamb Center and for just how they, they work day in and day out with this community that's so vulnerable. We thank you for our county government that's taken this on to support some of this as well. And so we just pray that, that everything would, would not only bless the people that are served, but it would ultimately point to you. And then, God, I just pray that you would be with us as we start a new small group semester in a, in a few weeks. I just pray that people would just make the right connections and get to know each other and begin to develop maybe new relationships or reestablishing relationships, that they would uh, care for one another during difficult times, and they would just grow together spiritually as they just look into Scripture and look into to spiritual topics as they continue to journey together. Now, God, open our hearts and our minds to what you want us to hear today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So today, I want to talk to you about how to read the Bible. Uh, I, I mentioned, you know, our small groups that that are starting into this month. Uh, most of our small groups, uh, you know, dig into Scripture in one way or another. Sometimes we do different types of groups where they're not necessarily doing that, or they may be on a specific topic that's not directly related to Scripture. But most of the time, there's a scriptural component to to our small groups. In fact, this coming semester, I'll, I will go over this in detail over the next couple of weeks. Our different groups, but this coming semester, one of our groups is is going to be doing a deeper dive into what we do on Sunday mornings, what we teach on Sunday mornings. They're going to take the message and then uh, go in a little bit deeper when they meet together as a group. A another group, um, our, our young adult group, is, is going to be doing dining through the Scriptures. They're going to be actually looking at parts of the Scripture where food or drink had a significant role in that particular, that particular part of Scripture. Uh, and, and the great thing about this group is their weekly snacks are going to be on theme with what they're talking about. I'm thinking about showing up the week they, that Jesus turns water into wine just to see what's happening on that particular week. I probably won't. Uh, but that's going to be a really, really fun group. I wish I was a young adult instead of an old adult, but I'm not. Um, another one of our groups, or actually a couple of our groups, are, are doing the same study. They're going to be looking at the I am statements of Jesus, where Jesus said various things, where he said, I am, you know, and, and, and then expounded on that. Uh, and another group, the group that, that I'm going to be hosting, my wife and I are going to be hosting is, is a Peter Enns study where, where Peter Enns will really challenge us in the way that we, that we view Scripture and the way that we read Scripture. He kind of pushes the envelope a little bit to make us think outside the box there. So that's just another quick plug uh, for small groups and how they can not only help connect you with other people and, and people care for one another through small group, but also how you, you, know, you can just dig a little bit deeper into Scripture uh, a little bit more through those as well. Now, as we think about reading the Bible, most people in our culture don't really read the Bible on a regular basis, right? In fact, I would go so far as to say, and I don't have any data to back this up, this is just kind of a gut feeling, gut reaction, but I would go so far as to say most Christians, most people who, who are followers of Jesus don't really read the Bible on a regular basis. 
And, and in today's culture, there's, there's, there's been a huge shift in today's culture where, where our culture, and, and again, this is true of, of people who call themselves Christians, people who follow Jesus, but our culture largely does not view Scripture as authoritative anymore in their lives. Now, when the Apostle Paul uh, was writing to a young man by the name of Timothy, and Timothy was a pretty new Christian, Paul was spiritually mentoring uh, Timothy, he became a leader, but, but when Paul was writing to Timothy, this is one of the things that he writes Timothy about the importance of Scripture. And this is in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul says, but as for you, Timothy, as for you, continue in what you have become convinced of because you know, you know those from whom you've heard it. In other words, Timothy, we've been teaching you this stuff. You know who's been teaching us. You have trust in the people who've been teaching. You know some of the people who've been teaching you this actually knew Jesus. And so continue in what you've been learning. Because you know those, those from, from whom you've learned it. And from infancy, you've known the Holy Scriptures. So you've been taught this all your life, Timothy. Which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says, all Scripture is God-breathed and is youthful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the Lord of God may be thoroughly equipped, so that the servants of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul is saying this scripture stuff, Timothy, this scripture stuff is really, really important. He's saying it's, it's, able, it's able to make you wise for salvation. In other words, just reading scripture and God working in your heart through the Holy Spirit can lead a person to, to find and know who God is. He said, Scripture, it teaches us truth. That It teaches us truth about ourselves. It teaches us truth about God. It teaches us truth about others, about our world and our culture. He says, Scripture rebukes us. And rebuke is kind of a harsh word. We don't really use that word in our English language very much. But he's just simply telling us that Scripture warns us. It warns us when we're, when we're heading down a path that, that might not be the healthiest path to go down that's going to lead us to an unhealthy place. And he says that Scripture corrects us, that when we go down that path and when we make some, some bad decisions, that it, helps, it kind of helps turn us around and get us going in the right direction. It's kind of like using Google Maps or Apple Maps, you know, the ones with a really nice voice to them, right? And, 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 and when, you're, when you're ignoring it and it's saying, turn left, turn left, turn left, and you just keep going straight, keep going straight until you've finally blown it and you've missed your turn, and all of that, and then it just says in a really nice voice, you know, make a U-turn as soon as legally possible, right? That's kind of what Scripture does for us. That, that, that's what Paul is saying. And he says it, it trains us in righteousness, that it not only points us in the right direction, but it, it gives us guidance a, along the way. But in spite of all that, like I said, most people, and again, even Christians, do not really read Scripture on a regular basis. And those that do, and this is really, really important for where we're going, but those that do, even those that, that do read it on a regular basis, a lot of us read it looking for the wrong thing. There's a guy by the name of Scott McKnight. He's a biblical scholar. He was a theology professor, and he wrote a book called The Blue Parakeet. The Blue Parakeet, Rethinking How You Read Scripture. And in this book, he calls this process that we use sometimes of reading Scripture and kind of looking for the wrong things, he calls them shortcuts. And, and he says that we've become really, really good in the church at creating shortcuts when it comes to reading Scripture. And, and here are three shortcuts that, that McKnight describes. One shortcut, he says, is people, people read the Bible, read Scripture like it's, a, like it's a legal document. They read the Bible like it's a set of bylaws. It's all about figuring out what they can do and what they cannot do. It's all about figuring out what, what God will allow and not allow and where is that line and how close can I get to it without actually stepping over it and all of that sort of thing. Uh, several years ago, there was a guy, and you may have seen these, these interviews because there were a lot of them. Um, there was a guy named A.J. Jacobs. And he, was a, he was a writer for Esquire magazine, and he wrote a book called The, the Year of Living Biblically. And, and what he did was he decided he was going to take an entire year, and during that year, he was going to try to obey every command, every rule, every law in Scripture. And so he went through Scripture, he read through it with a fine-tooth comb, made notes of all of them. He came up with a 72-page document, over 700 rules, regulations, laws in Scripture that he found. Rules all the way from things like do not murder and do not steal, all the way to you know, avoid wearing clothes made of mixed fibers, don't shave your beard, and play a 10-string harp. Okay, 
So every rule he could find in Scripture. And he went for an entire year and tried to to live without breaking any of those 700-plus rules. And and Jacob did a lot of of interviews. You can Google it and go and see some of these interviews that he did. But he did a lot of interviews when his book came out. And one of the things that he said was that was just so interesting. He said, he said, I'm just astounded at how much I send. He said he just couldn't keep the rules. And that's one of the things that, that Paul, if you read Paul, actually tells us about the, the law is that make, it makes us aware of stuff in our life, but it's unable to do anything about it. That's why Jesus actually had to come. And now, there were all kinds of problems with Jacob's experience. First of all, uh, one, he didn't, he didn't make any effort to understand the context of the Old Testament laws. He didn't make any distinctions between ritualistic laws and ceremonial laws and all of that. And two, he had no real concept of the Old Covenant and how the Old Covenant was rooted in the law and the rules and the New Covenant is rooted in Christ and Christ is the fulfillment of the law. But the real problem with his experience was was this, and I think, I think it's, it's, it's one that a lot of people, Christian people, just reading the Bible have as well, that, that like many of us, even Christians, he was reading Scripture primarily as a legal document. Primarily as a document that, that, that says, you know, what does God say I can do and what does God say I can't do? Now, the Bible obviously sets boundaries for us, right? It sets boundaries in terms of our behavior. It sets boundaries in terms of our attitudes and all of that. But when we read Scripture primarily as a legal document, we lose something really, really important. The second shortcut that people take is, is reading people read, reading the Bible like it's a catalog of blessings and promises. Now, there are a lot of promises in Scripture. In fact, there are over 7,000 promises that God makes in, in Scripture. The Bible is filled with all kinds of promises, all kinds of blessings, but it's also filled with, with words of warning. It, it, it's filled with words of judgment. It, it, it tells us things that, that when we read it, it makes us feel really, really good. It also tells us things that when we read them and hear them, it makes us feel somewhat uncomfortable. Uh, sometimes the Bible confronts us with a, with a truth that we'd really rather not be confronted with. And, and some people never get beyond the blessing and promises, kind of the feel-good parts of the Bible. And they miss out on some incredibly important stuff that God wants to say to them. And then McKnight says there's one more category. He says some people read the Bible like it's an inkblot test. Now, you know what an inkblot test is, right? It's a tool that psychologists use to examine the, the, the personality or the characteristics and the emotional functionality of their, of their patients. And basically, they show you an inkblot test, which is just randomly made, randomly formed, no rhyme or reason to it. And, and, and they show it to you, and they ask, what do you see? And, and whatever you see on it is, is what you are projecting, is what the person is projecting onto that, onto that ink blot. And the idea is that that tells you something about that person or about that person's personality. And a lot of people read the Bible that way. In fact, I would say that all of us do this to some extent. We, we read the Bible and we project our own personal value system onto Scripture. For example, Republicans tend to see Jesus as a Republican, and Democrats tend to see Jesus as a Democrat. And the result of of all of this projecting is people start making Jesus more and more like them rather than them becoming more and more like him. And and a lot of us do that. We project our value system onto Scripture and and onto Christ, and we look for Scripture in some way to affirm the the beliefs that we've already formed. We want the Bible to tell us that that we're okay, right, That, that we're fine. But sometimes we're not okay. Sometimes we're sick and we need a healer. And and sometimes we're lost and we need someone to help us get back on track. And and sometimes we're blind and we need someone to open our eyes so that we can see things differently or see things as they actually are. Sometimes there are things that we need to be confronted with in our lives. And Scripture does that if we don't project our own value systems on it and instead allow it to speak to us. So the question for us today is, is how then should you read the Bible? I mean, with all of that in mind, how should, how should we approach it? How should we read it? You know, what should be at the forefront when we study and read Scripture? Well, basically, I would say we should read by the Bible like it's a story, because that's what it is. It's a story. I mean, from Genesis to Revelation, from the first chapter to the last, it's a, it's a story. Now, we love stories, don't we? 
I mean, we're, we're a culture that loves stories. We love novels, we love movies, we love TV series, all of that. One of my, you know, one of my favorite classes way back when I was in, was in college was a history class. It was taught by a, by a professor named Dr. Tony Eastman. And, and the reason I love Dr. Eastman's class so much, I love history, but the reason I particularly loved his class was, was he would spend most of the class just telling stories. In fact, he would usually come in each day, maybe write a couple things on the board, take, take roll, and then he would sit down literally on top of his desk, cross his legs, and just begin telling us stories of history. And every now and then, to, to make the people who, who didn't like the stories, who actually liked taking the notes, to make them happy, he would get up and go write something on the board that he wanted us to get, that he knew was going to be on the test, and then he would go back to telling us stories. And I learned so much history from Dr. Eastman's class, because I could just sit there and I could just absorb it, and I could remember it because of how it was told to me as a story. We love stories. We're captivated by stories. We can relate to stories. That's why we pay millions and millions of dollars a year to go to movies or to stream them on our devices, because we, we love stories. We love getting into the story and, and identifying with some of the characters in that story and living through that, that story by watching or, or reading that story. Well, that's what the Bible is. The Bible is a story at heart, but it's a different kind of a story. It's a story that tells us the truth about ourselves, about what we're like and, and who we are and what we struggle with. It's a story that, that tells us the truth about this incredible contrast of how, on one hand, we are these creations that were created in the, in the image of God, and yet at the same time we're capable of such profound darkness and sin. Scripture tells us the truth about that. It tells us the truth about this world and who created it and where history is moving in time. And it, it, it tells us about the truth about, about God, this, this reconciling, forgiving, restoring God who before you and I were ever even born was making a plan for us and providing for our redemption and for our reconciliation with him. It's this story about a God who, who not only created us, but created us so that we could have a personal an intimate relationship with him. It's an incredible story. You know, a few weeks ago, as, as part of our Christmas series, we, we looked at a, at a story in the Bible that I think is just a great, great example of how the entire Bible is connected into this, into this larger, broader story. It was a story of, of Ruth and, and Naomi. You might have been here, and you might remember that story. And Naomi was a, was a Jewish woman who was married and her and her husband had two boys, and, and then famine hit the land in Israel, and so the family moved to nearby country by the name of, of Moab. And while Naomi was, was there, her, her sons got married, but then her husband died. And so it's just her and, and her two sons, and, and so she's, she's raising them, and they're married. And, and then the worst thing happened. Naomi, both of her sons, they both die as well. And so it's, now it's just Naomi and her two daughters-in-law. And when Naomi finds out that the famine is over in Israel, she decides she's going to go back home, back to her homeland. And so what she says to her daughter-in-laws is essentially this. She says, look, I'll be fine. You don't need to follow me all the way back to where I'm going. I'll be okay. And this is, this is where the two of you grew up. This is your homeland. This is where you have other family. And this is probably the best place for you to find new husbands. So you stay here. I'm going back to Israel. Don't worry. Mom will be fine. And, and so she gets ready to go back home, back to Israel. And, and one of her daughters-in-law, Orpah, stays behind in Moab. But the other one, Ruth, just cannot go along with this. And, and here's, what, here's what she says to her mother-in-law, Naomi. Here's, what, here's the dialogue between Ruth and Naomi. She says, look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. So you go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. And then she says, where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. And Naomi, your people will be my people, and your God is going to be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates me from you. Now, what is Ruth saying here to her mother-in-law, Naomi? She's, she's saying this. She's saying, Naomi, your story has become my story. It, it's not these two separate stories anymore. Our stories have become intertwined. They become interconnected. Your story has become my story. Now, this is the ultimate goal when we read the Bible. 
Yes, the Bible is filled with, with all kinds of guidance, and it sets boundaries for us in terms of our attitudes and our behaviors and all of that. And yes, it gives us is wisdom, and it, and it shows us the promises and the blessings of God that He has for us. But ultimately, when we read the story of redemption, of God's grace, of God's plan for this world, it's a story of, of Scripture becoming our story. It's about us reading Scripture and seeing ourselves in the characters that we're reading about. Same struggles, same failures, same hurts, same pains, same issues, and ultimately the same need that every single character in the story of, of the Bible has, and that's the need for forgiveness and grace and mercy and reconciliation. And so when we read Scripture, that's the goal, that we would see ourselves in the story of God working in this world. So here's what I want to invite you to today. I want to invite you to make Scripture, to make Scripture a priority in your life for just one month. And maybe it already is, and, and, and you don't need to do any of this. But if it's not, uh, experts tell us that it takes about 21 days for something to become a habit in, in, in our lives. And so I want you to join me in reading through the book of Acts. The book of Acts is in the New Testament. It's just after the Gospels. And Acts has 28 chapters. Most of them are pretty short. And so this is really doable. This is really easy to do. And here's why I picked the book of Acts. And by the way, we did an entire series on Acts uh, at, towards the end of, of last year. But here's why I picked Acts, because it will help you see the story of God's work of redemption in this world. The book of Acts is all about God starting the church and the struggles that the early Christians had during that time and the faith that they built in the middle of all of that. They discovered that, that they were a part of God's story, and my hope is that all of us will too. So whether you're a new believer, a new follower of Jesus, a longtime follower of Jesus, someone who's not even sure about any of this religion or Jesus or God stuff, I hope you will see yourself as a part of God's story and a part of what God is doing in this world as we dig into Scripture over the next month. So let's make Scripture a priority, and, and let's see what happens in the midst of all of that. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I thank you for, for this story, for, what, for, for these words that Paul said to Timothy, just reminding him of how important this Scripture stuff is. And God, whether it's important to us or not, I pray that we would begin to, to look at Scripture and we would begin to see ourselves in the middle of all of it, that we would recognize that we are a part of this story that, that you are working in this world and that we would discover you in a new way in the middle of all that. Over the next month, I pray that we would all figure out one way, whether it's reading through Acts or, or utilizing some other resource, but we would figure out a way just to make Scripture a priority in our lives again. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Our worship team is going to lead us in a song, and then we're going to share communion together. And I want to invite you uh, to communion this morning, whether you're here or or you're in person, and like I said, if you didn't grab your elements on the way in, you can sneak out while they're, while they're singing and, and grab those. Um, I want to read a passage from, from 1 Corinthians that Paul writes, because Paul wrote, wrote some instruction in how we should approach our communion table when we come to it. And, and if you're a follower of Jesus, I, like I said, I invite you to, to join us in this this morning. But here's what Paul said. Paul said, for, for I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And then Paul says this to us. He says, A person ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So this is your opportunity to do just that. As our team leads us this morning, it's your opportunity to prepare your hearts for communion. You'll find your bread element on the, on the bottom, on the smaller side, if you want to go ahead and take that. And let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for inviting us to be a part of your story, just like you invited the disciples and Mary and Martha and Paul and Timothy to be a part of what you're doing in this world, you invite us in the same way, on the same level, to be a part of that. And you're not asking us just to be observers from the outside, wishing we could be in the story, that we're a part of it. So we thank you for that. I thank you for communion. Thank you for 
this beautiful symbol to remind us that we're a part of what you're doing in this world and to remind us of what you did for us so that we could be a part of that. So for that, we give you thanks. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Like Paul said on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and when he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Whenever you eat it, remember me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup represents a new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Scripture tells us that when he and the disciples had had finished that night, they sang a song and then they went out. So I want to ask our our team to come back up and lead us in a closing song. While While they're coming, I just want to remind you to to check out our small groups this week. Uh, I'd love to talk to you about those. Our staff would love to talk to you. See our hypothermia team. If you haven't signed up for a slot in hypothermia and you're available to help serve that week, go ahead and see them on your way out. They'll be out in the lobby and can help you do that. Let's stand and sing one more time. I hope you have a great week wherever you are this week.